What's going on, y'all? Welcome back. Uh, it's no secret at this point that we've got a little bit of a new addiction, new hobby in the sport of fishing. It's called fly fishing. <laughs> we just actually posted one of our bait casters for sale on Instagram a handful of nights ago, looking to uh, help fund the new addiction. And it sold in like just a few hours. <laughs> so uh, the reason we sold that die was because it's one of our newer reels. It was still like worth a, a fair amount of money, so we could put that towards a new fly fishing rod reel or combo. Uh, it might not be enough for hardly any of that. It might only be enough for a reel. We don't really know. But we've stopped over at the Orvis store here in Plano, Texas, and we're gonna see what all they've got here. We might also go to Tailwaters in Dallas at some point. Let us know what type of gear we should be looking into. And we may also post a couple more bait casters for sale, potentially other traditional casting gear, because we do want to get a couple combos. And we don't necessarily just want to break the bank and spend, you know, 1,000 bucks plus on two nicer setups. Or, you know, maybe not that much. Maybe a couple hundred bucks on a combo. I'm not entirely sure. We haven't really looked at high dollar fly fishing gear like we're about to when we step inside. But uh, we do have an idea. And there's definitely a reel that we're looking at that is somewhere around the $300 price range. And that's one reel. So just starting things off with that, we might have to sell a few more things. I'm, I'm thinking about selling the, the DRT Ghost just because I don't throw it often enough to hardly justify keeping it. I know it's a limited edition. We paid $340 for it after tax and shipping. It's a, it's a bait. If you guys are unfamiliar with it, it's a DRT swim bait. And then we bought the hooks for it. So maybe we'll let that thing go. We're kind of undetermined. What's up, plane? All right, it's about gone. Anyways, let's step inside Orvis and see what all they've got. I want to introduce you all to some uh, decent fly fishing gear, aside from just that $30 budget combo we got from Academy. So here we go. Blue reel with green line. I think that's what I want. All right, y'all, we had to kind of skip ahead. This is now four days later. Let me tell you what happened. We went into the Orvis store. Their fishing manager was not there, but we were able to kind of get some help. And I had already looked at quite a few reviews and identified the reel I wanted. So many folks have talked about how this is one of the best fly fishing reels for bass specifically, which is gonna be the majority of what we're targeting, obviously, just because of our location. And so we went with the Hydros. This is actually the Hydros 3, so it's kind of in the middle of the lineup as far as the sizing. So you might get a smaller one if you're going with the uh, lighter weight rod, or a larger one if you're going with maybe like an eight weight or something. We kind of determined that we liked a six weight rod, and what we're about to do is take you down to Tailwaters in Dallas, because we only grabbed the reel, and this was actually the only one in the size three left in the country at the time of recording. So there could be more shipments that are going to arrive, but this is actually a limited color. I had no idea. I just started looking around and I really liked the idea of a blue fly reel. And then I see this one by Orvis and I'm like, okay, great, let's get this one. And you like can't find it anywhere. So we went in store and they had one, I believe it was in their North Carolina location and that's where this reel came from. It was the last one in size three. Nowhere else had it. Couldn't find them online. Even if you saw them, they were sold out. Uh, or maybe in some like really weird size for the rod that we didn't want. And so, boom. Uh, I'm not going to showcase it just yet because, like I say, we're about to take you down to Tailwaters in Dallas, one of the best fly fishing shops in the entire country. And it happens to be local to us. A guy named Christian down there hit me up. We've talked about collaborating in the past on some fly content, and we just kind of never put it together and made it happen, probably on my end. And so, needless to say, he reached out again and said, hey, we'll, uh, we'll hook you up, come on down here, and let's set you up with a rod, some line, and get you really ready to hit the water. We can also practice your casting. So what you're about to see is footage from us down at the Tailwaters Fly Shop, and Christian breaks everything down. We cover a whole lot of rods from the essentially entry level, although there is cheaper stuff out there if you buy outfits that are already, you know, combos at the store, all the way up to the most expensive, and he's gonna tell you a little bit about each and every rod. We're right there with you asking questions that maybe the new fly fisherman would ask. After he's done breaking down the rods, we actually go out back and he helps show us how to cast a little bit better so that we're improving our fly cast. So let's take y'all down to the shop. We're gonna get this thing spooled up. You are now about to see it for the first time. It is such a sick colorway. Here we go. All 
All right, y'all, we have made it. We got the old Orvis on the counter and we've whipped out some six weight rods. And by we, I mean Christian. He's showing us the whole deal. We already talked about some flies and I'm gonna be asking him some questions on these six weight options that he's pulled out for us. And uh, we're gonna even ch check out the store here a little bit more in a moment. But uh, while he gives us the rundown, I didn't want him necessarily just telling me all the information. I'd love for y'all to hear some of this because of course on, the, on our channel, all this is brand new to me and, and new to quite a few of you as well. I know I've heard a lot of the comments. So if we can share some insights, we're certainly gonna try. Christian's gonna go over again some of these options here, tell us some pros and cons, price points, things of that nature. So we're gonna let him just kind of get straight into it and then we'll talk about uh, all the other goodies we might be getting for this reel today. So uh, Christian, everybody, howdy, everybody, howdy. Christian. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool. just whatever so you got for us. We've narrowed down that we wanna do a six weight. Um, so I, I've laid them out from, from lower price point to high. Got it. Um, and we'll start there and we'll just kind of talk through the company themselves and, and, and kind of go that route. So um, TFO distributed here in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, great rods, bang for your buck rods. Um, uh, the owner's in here all the time, giving us a hard time and <laughs> great guy. Uh, the, the benefits TFO is, is because you live in Dallas and you right. fish all the time. Mm -hmm. You break it tomorrow, you can yeah. bring it back to me and I can go to TFO five minutes down the street and yep. get it repaired. So, and I like um, that too. And I know some of y'all probably know Pond Boys and uh, that bass fishing dude, they've used uh, some TFO rods in the past too. I didn't know they were so heavily into fly fish. I was naive. I didn't know they were so heavily into it, but they are. So that's the first option. They are. And, and so when we're talking about six weights, there's kind of two ways that we can talk about it. There's kind of the more trout driven six weight mm -hmm. in, in terms of feel and action. Um, and then also the way that the rods are displayed, you'll see these don't have fighting butts and these do. Uh, yep, um, yep. And then there's, there's the inverse with the fighting butts and a little bit faster action. Um, and and fighting butt to me is a preference. So got it. Pr I prefer fighting butt on a six weight. Yeah. Anything five and under, I'll, I'll skip a fighting butt. I feel like to me this is going to feel more natural just exactly. because I'm used to the bass gear. The, no, I'm sorry, not the bass gear. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to the casting gear, which has that longer butt end, and it's it's that's going to feel similarly balanced. I would assume. Well, to it's me, a but tool. Who knows? It's a tool, right? So for me, I could buy a, a really pretty. For example, the, the Sage mm -hmm. that's made in Bainbridge and is it's an awesome company. They've been around for a really long time. Yep. Um, but that little nice mm. end cap is gonna get scuffed up as I trout fish and bang my way through Colorado and yep. hit it on rocks and fall on it and all this stuff. So a fighting butt can be used as a tool. Um, you know, a lot of times if I'm climbing up a steep bank, I'll, I'll actually yes. you know <laughs> use my fighting butt um, and and I don't have to worry about tearing up a, a real wood real seat. Uh, a lot of times guys in Colorado, five and under, th that's normal, is mm -hmm. without a fighting butt. And they'll be beat five up. Five and under, five weight rod and under. Five weight rod and under. Got yep. it, got it. Um, you're rarely gonna see a three weight with a fighting butt or a two weight. It, it yep. would look weird to it guys would. like me because mm -hmm. I'd be like, who would do that, right? <laughs> um, but, so one, look wise and then two, action wise. The second company is kind of interesting and I thought you might be intrigued on it. Um, Thompson Thomas. Got it. They're made in the USA. They were super popular probably 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they went through some ownership changes and now they're back and they're, they're doing a bunch of marketing and, and all the big name guys in the industry are fishing them. Um, and I think they're, they're a great rod. The benefit is a lot of the made in America rod companies yes. don't make middle price point rods. So it's kind I've of- I've noticed that. It's kind of a low <laughs> price point and then you're all in, yeah. right? So, the middle price point rod is kind of an interesting one. Mm -hmm. and, and they're starting to make a, a comeback. For Forever we sold low price point and high price point. What is middle price point? Typically you're gonna say low price point, 300 and under. Got it, got it. Somewhere around 500 is mid, mm -hmm. and then high is nine and up, right? Oh, no, we'll, call it <laughs> we'll, well, we'll get him into one, of those, don't worry. Um, but, so the zone from TF, or TNT, is that middle price point rod at 495. It's a badass made in America six weight. Cool. There's nowhere, I mean, it will do everything you want it to do. It's got probably a little bit more bells and whistles in terms of a little bit nicer cork, um, you know, brush stainless reel seat, and then a little bit of a step up in componentry. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see that they don't sand in or paint their graphite. So okay. when this graphite's rolled, mm -hmm. it's rolled on a mandrel, it's put into a giant oven. Um, this is how it comes out in this raw form. Got it. And the company can choose like Sage to sand that off and then epoxy and paint and do all this other stuff to mm -hmm. it. Um, and there's some companies, Scott, 
Um, don't quote me on it, but I believe Scott started that. They, okay. they wanted to leave the rod as natural as possible. They said if, if you paint it and you, you slap a bunch this of coats in the Scott. epoxy, that's the Scott. Okay. Um, and we'll get to the Scott. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> um, that's the, the my, my personal favorite. But um, none of them are bad, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other conversation I always have with customers. People right. always ask me, well, what do you like? Well, what I like is different than what you're going to like or what you need, right? Mm -hmm. So um, TNT, great price point, great rod, made in America. Um, a lot of the main America companies have that great warranty that we talked about prior to, yep. to them tuning in. Um, and that was one thing I wanted to point out too, because a lot of a lot of our gear, right, in the casting world, I think there's maybe a one year, two year warranty. It sounds like in the fly fishing realm, a lot of it is uh, when you get into the higher quality stuff is Correct. lifetime. It's a lifetime. Warranty, generally yeah. speaking, so Most I mean, doesn't get much better than that, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the comment that I made to you earlier is fly rods break. It's it's part of the game. It's a well known thing. Um, there's car windows and doors and your buddy and the dog tail and, <laughs> and the ceiling fan. I've heard it all. Um, nothing that's nine foot in length that's this thin at oh, the yeah. tip is, yeah. is gonna stay in one piece all the time. Rarely do they break on fish. I mean, you can look around and see all these fish were caught with fly rods all around the shop. Oh, uh, there, so oh, look, I said, so there's a jack, right? And then we got a permit. A permit. Same thing, but different. And then we got, <laughs> I see a redfish. That's a, that was this guy right here. Okay, and then we got the old largey, huh? Old largey, got a rainbow up there, and, and Monty and Peacock. So there's a lot of cool <laughs> stuff that you can do with fly fishing. Crazy. We do it a little different. Um, but that's that's the benefit uh, to not only maybe spending a little bit more money, is mm -hmm. the company is going to back you. Uh, and, and people ask me all the time, you know, well, well, what if this rod's 40 years old? The best part is if they've got some you know, lightsaber out now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, <laughs> yeah. uh, they will replace that rod with, with the comparable line no way. to what it is now, okay. regardless of price changes and all that. So like pretty this. cool in that fact. Um, the next is, is kind of the same company, but two totally different rods. Okay. Um, we'll start with the X, which would be my rod of choice. Mm -hmm. um, for for a certain guy that wants to do a certain thing. So the X is Sage. And this is Sage, yeah. Sage. Now we're in the Sage. They're main Bainbridge Island, Washington. Um, been around forever. Kind of the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows them. Lots of guides use them. Uh, super, super popular. Great company. Um, so Sage X in specific is kind of their flagship freshwater model, I got right? It. Um, a lot of companies, Scott does it as well, TNT does it as well, will do kind of a, a lower weight mm -hmm. freshwater and then higher weight, they'll, they'll market to a saltwater market and okay. the rod will change a lot and, and it'll have a little bit more beef and backbone. So this one specifically has a little bit more touch and feel. Um, great casting rod, super light in the hand, something that you wouldn't want to replace <laughs> ever, right? Yeah. Um, you're not gonna buy this one and go, man, I wish I had one step up because yeah. you're, you're at the top, right? Yep. Past that, you've got the igniter, which is marketed more as a saltwater six weight, right? Okay. So you've got a freshwater six weight and then you have something a little beefier. Can they both do freshwater? Yes, Right, so you're not looking like a goofball when you walk around this to the ponds or you're totally. gonna look like a goofball. Totally. <laughs> no, I mean, nobody's gonna know the difference. It, it really comes down to what you're doing and, mm -hmm. and what size flies you're throwing and, and what you want out of your rod. Okay. Me, as, as a, a guy that's been doing this for a long time, I might want a little bit of a faster rod for bass fishing, yes. but I'm gonna want this tenfold over for trout fishing okay. all day long, right? Yeah. So, it's so a, a good all different. purpose, say we take the six weight out of state or something, so you're liking this guy right here. I'm liking for... this guy for the trout factor, mm -hmm. right? If you decide to hop in the van and drive 13 hours and go trout fishing, this is gonna feel overkill because it's so stiff, even yeah. though it's a, a six, it's gonna feel overkill. Mm -hmm. um, and we've already kind of talked about how a, a five might be more ideal for trout, but if we're going with kind of one to encompass everything yeah, for Swiss us. Army knife. Yeah, so right. <laughs> if we got an all purpose, I like the idea of a six. We've gone back and forth with so many of you in the DMs and, uh, and then just, of course, comments on these videos so far. A lot of y'all are liking the idea of a six weight, so there we six go. Six weight's great. I mean, we, we had the conversation of you may be limited to fly size, but mm -hmm. you're gonna 
eventually probably buy an eight and then yes. a four and then then you're down the rabbit hole right so and so what he's talking about with limited by fly size is that you, you know the rods oftentimes you don't necessarily need an eight for the size caliber of fish you're catching an eight weight you might you know a five or a six weight could work perfect for that size fish but it's going to dictate oftentimes the size of flies you can throw because the action of the rod and also the fly line that you pair with it which you get into the heavier fly line then you can cast those baits a little bit further it all just kind of ties together it's a beautiful system and uh, you don't want to be pairing a sound like those big old large arbor reels with that small you know three five weight rod with some fly line that's inadequate so we're just kind of figuring it all totally. out totally we're talking it through <laughs> um by the way i didn't go through price point this guy's 279 279 this guy's 495 okay 900 900 950 got it 1050. 1050. Right, and that's so uh, the Scott, Scott is the 1050. So cool. Scott's man, Montrose, Colorado. Um, I've got a lot of guide buddies that uh, fish a lot of Scott. I was put onto the Scott bug um, by kind of the guy that mentored me up here and, and I fished with for a really long time. Scott just does um, things a little different. They, they've got maybe a hair more features on their rod so mm -hmm. you can see there's a 12 inch mark um engraved in there there's a this is this mark. is from the butt end and this is for almost sizing your fish or yeah, no yeah like or if no. i catch a, a trout on the river and mm -hmm. i don't have a measuring tape and mm -hmm. i want to you know bullshit with my buddies at the bar later i'll yeah. be like oh dude see i got my <laughs> mark you know so is 12 um, also significant in any way like for a size you could keep or have to put back or no uh, it, is may that be. Not, it may so, be so depending on what state you're in but then that comes into you know fly fishermen mm -hmm. really don't keep fish now yeah. Yeah. most of us are not opposed to it guys that really fish yeah. and work in the industry and are here all the time i love eating trout I, every time i go camping every summer i yep. will totally whack a few trout but it's not the <laughs> reason i go fishing right yep. um the reason i go fishing is to be outside and, and enjoy what what i'm doing um it's not to to get my limit and then go home and, and do this big grill beer drinking thing. So yep. um, that's kind of the curveball that a lot of people come into the fly fishing industry. Well, you guys don't keep fish. Well, not not true at all. Yeah. Um, I'm not Before you cover more on this one too, one question I have is uh, these are all nine foot, I imagine. All nine foot. Yeah, that's a great point. We didn't talk about that. And maybe four piece? It seems They're to be all the norm. four piece. Okay, yeah. just um, checking, just the, checking. You're good. The progression was two piece rods cast better mm -hmm. back in the day, mm -hmm. but they're paying the butt to travel with. Of right? course can't travel with them. Um, I well, think we know very, all too very, well very, with the casting gear. <laughs> very easily, right? So um, then, you know, the, the question asks, well, four piece rods, how do we create a rod that doesn't have this big bulky ferrule that's gonna make the rod cast poorly? Uh -huh. um, and that's where the recessed ferrule comes into play, which most modern day companies are using now, mm -hmm. um, where they've got a plug on this side, on the, on the male side, and then the female side is perfectly designed to recess over your over yep. the male section. So some people may have this question too. I'm sorry to cut yeah. you off so no, much, but good. I'm just we're thinking, good. okay, what is the new fly fisherman thinking or wanting to ask right here with us today? And I know that like, okay, so let's say you do get a thousand dollar rod, totally. right? And it's four pieces and you're casting all day and you're not necessarily checking to make sure it's in there yeah. tight. How often would you say you might uh, throw a piece out or throw a couple pieces it's out or does it question. almost never happen? It's a great question. Never happens to me. And it probably happens to <laughs> a lot of people that don't know. Yes. I did this for probably two and a half years while I was working here until somebody showed me the proper way to put a rod together. And okay. we'll, we'll talk about that. So some rod companies do what, what are called alignment dots. Yep, you I see, see those little dots. dots. Um, and some don't. Sage is a company that doesn't do them. So mm -hmm. um, kind of have to check with what rod you have. If your rod doesn't have alignment dots, the easiest way to line up the guides is to put your reel on first. Mm. If your rod does have alignment dots, you don't have to use the reel as a guideline, right? Okay. But most people, when they put a fly rod together, they line up the dots and the old guy will tell you, oh, use a little bit of wax on your ear, ah. on your nose, so that they don't stick. I think it's totally not necessary in, modern, in modern day rods. Um, so what you're doing wrong is you're pushing the rod straight down. Okay. And the rod will come straight apart, right? Okay. Um, and over time, that graphite heats and cools and changes. So after a long day, it might just be barely on there and you're gonna make one cast, it's gonna fly off. Mm -hmm. Here's what you should do. There goes a thousand have, bucks. If you have, <laughs> exactly. If you have alignment dots, yes. what you should do is 45 degree them, right? Mm -hmm. We're not pushing down, we're just gonna set it on there. Got it. And as I push down, I twist Kay. to center. Got it. So I don't know if they saw that, but I'll That is a up. pro tip right there. And watch the difference, right? So I think those are lined up. Yeah. Right, 45 degrees. I'm gonna push to center. 
right? And, you hit and them now, with that twist. and now, it's a Way lot more harder force. to pull off. Exactly. Wow. So, Forty-five degree your alignment dots. Your rod won't fall apart, and and you won't break stuff. So we're um, learning. <laughs> but past that, the Scott, um, they they just do things differently. Um, they don't sand and paint their graphite. They, mm -hmm. um, I don't believe they ever have. At least in my time of, of working in the industry, they haven't. Uh, they actually hand wrap and roll all of these in a little teeny tiny shop in Montrose, Colorado. So great brand, great company. They all are, right? Everybody yeah. will, will tell me, well, then you like Scott, I guess I'll buy a Scott. No, absolutely not. The best way to go buy a fly rod is to put it in your hand and cast it, regardless of if you can cast or if you can't cast. Mm -hmm. At least you'll get a little bit of a feel and a little bit of a taste of what you're spending money on. Um, and and don't always take my advice or, or the internet's advice for the Sage X is the best. The <laughs> um, put it in your hand and cast it. Uh, that's the best way to buy one. It's kind of the rundown on on six weights. It all changes when we talk different. It all rods. changes when we talk about different. Rods. So y'all have seen the rundown. I'm gonna play just most of that for y'all unedited. You know, I want you guys to get as much from it as possible. We're now going to uh, probably put each one of these in the hand. See what we're thinking. Uh, I'm liking the idea of something budget to get started, right? And then, of course, uh, work our way up through the tiers as far as price point goes as we have fished a little bit more. And so, I'm liking the idea of the cheaper options. But with that being said, I don't think the Sage or the Scott is out of the question. Scott or Scott's? Scott. I don't think the Scott is out of the question, uh, probably even in the very near future. <laughs> so, it happens fast. <laughs> it happens fast. <laughs> hey, look, we've already went through three comp. Yeah, we've already went through three combos and now we've got kind of like the fourth reel we've used and we've been uh, into this whole fly fishing thing for probably two weeks max. So, you know, of course we're going with the budget stuff, the old Academy and the Shields brand, but well, now we're stepping it up. So. The, best, the best way to do it is if you have the time and you have a little bit of time, let me go grab a six weight reel okay. with some line on it. Yep. May not be the line that we buy today, but it's going to be close. Fine. So let me go grab a reel and a line and what we'll do is we'll kind of narrow it down. We won't cast all of them, but right, let's grab right. a few that we think might fit. Maybe this one's out because it's a little stiff. It might not cover mm -hmm. the trout game. Um, maybe the TNT is uh, a perfect kind of in-between and it's worthwhile casting, then we can cast these guys as well. Cool. So, All right. I'm going to go grab a reel and hang out. Time to cast. Got her? Mm-hmm. The casting grounds. Nice. <laughs> Muddy. Yeah, Muddy check us out. <laughs> conversation of letting line go and gaining distance right mm -hmm. everything is is related to the weight of the fly line right mm -hmm. if I have 10 foot of fly line that weighs a certain amount which is nothing right if I add 20 foot right now that fly line has become longer and heavier so it requires a little bit longer of a weight it also requires a little bit heavier of a pickup and, and a little bit more power to my stop managing how much you let out as you're letting it out is really important. Oh. You don't just want to kind of let cast it and, and just do this, right? Because okay. you're going to start to get too much line and you're not adjusting here. And you'll get what, what I call the wet noodle in the air where you just kind of can't keep up with it. And yeah. It does this. It's because you got too much line out. So if you ever get to that situation, just strip in. Yeah, so if we're casting really far, we're going to let our fly line do that number. It's a lot easier to start with 20 and shoot 50 than it is to start with 50 and shoot 60, right? <laughs> so I use that reference when I'm teaching. I tell people, don't try and pick this up and be all stretched out and doing all this. Mm -hmm. Just shorten up, go ahead and fish your fly to you. And yeah. now we want to target over there. I'm actually going to pick up and make a better cast into that direction, Got right? It. So um, let's see what you're working with now. Yeah. Wait on your back cast. There it is. Okay. So letting go a little. Oh, and it, and it likes to tangle over there it at does, the end. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a couple of things there. We waited on our back cast, or we didn't on the first one, yes. we did on the second one. Yep. But when you let your line go, think about the rod at, at 12 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Yep. That's kind of your, your zone of, of thought when you're casting. Let me demo. <laughs> right? So yep. this Elegant. versus kind of okay. doesn't do anything. It doesn't really want to, or, right? Yeah. When I'm pushing too hard. I heard that. Yeah, I heard that. But if I just, the other it's thing. It's still early. It's still okay. early. It's okay. The other thing is you don't have to let line go every time. If you watch when I'm casting, I'm, I, 
I, I'm relatively relaxed, and and yeah, my power definitely. doesn't come from force necessarily. Yes. Right. Like yes. that was yes. really a forceful mm -hmm. stop. And that's and that might be when everything gets squiggly anyway. Exactly. Huh? I, I can get that. the same result by just stopping the rod tip. Right. So if you <laughs> slow down a little bit oh, and you just focus on stop yes. and let the line go, yep. it'll be a lot better. Okay. Oh. The way that I roll up when I'm when I'm going bass fishing is it, it is the worst part about fly fishing. I've got all this line down here. It's a pain in the butt. It gets hung up everywhere, but it's there if I need it. If I limit myself like what we were doing, I might have the power to shoot as much line as I want, but mm -hmm. I'm going to be limited, right? Yeah. So I'll roll up with maybe a little bit more line than I need and, and just it's part of the game. You just have excess. Exactly. So that when I'm casting and I do make a really good cast, and I can release, I have all that excess line that is able to go outside of the rod. Yep. Um, so play around with that, and it doesn't mean that you have to throw the whole thing, yes, right? Maybe yeah. that wasn't the goal, but the goal is, okay, if I'm looking at 50 feet and I wanna make a 50 foot cast, if I only have 40 foot, I'm totally, um, I'm not, yeah, it's not happening. Exactly. But now I can give myself a little bit more. So maybe have a little bit more with the expectation that you're not gonna throw it all. Okay. But as you progress, you might be surprised, right? We're trying to dial this in, man. I, I yeah. was being a little too hasty. I was being a little too quick, I think, with some of my pulls, creeping it sounds like. I was creeping, it sounds like. Uh, it sounds like that bull whip or there's kind of that pop. Totally. You hear that pop, maybe you're going a little too fast with things is what it made it yeah, sound you're, like. Yeah, you're bringing your rod forward before the loop is fully unraveled. Okay, the back or the so front. I'm not giving it enough time necessarily. Also, I'm pretty like fierce, it sounds like with my pops and I could be a little bit more elegant and relaxed. Let the, let the rod do the work. Let the rod do the work. And I'm releasing the line a little too early. Once I get that rod to go out and forwards, I'm releasing that line a little too early rather than letting the, the rod fully get flexed, I guess you could say, and then releasing my hand and letting that line flow out nice and easy. So a couple little things we're dialing in real quick. <laughs> the last thing I'll tell you guys, everybody's obsessed with loop shape with, with, a, with a fly rod and okay. your loops. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> if, if we imagine that this, this big open kind of billowing loop that that's not wind resistant, it's not accurate and kind of has this rainbow situation. One, I, I'm not going to be able to get much distance with that. It's, it's not mm -hmm. very accurate. And a lot of people will tell you stop at 10 o'clock on the back and two o'clock on the, or uh, I'm sorry, 10 on the front, two on the back. Mm -hmm. And well, cause I tried this 10 and two thing. Cause that's all I've heard on yeah. YouTube and stuff. And it seemed like 10 well, was maybe not right for me It's terrible. at, at first. It, it's kind of the, the generic rule of thumb of I'm, I'm a casting instructor. This is how I'm going to teach you, but nobody yes. explains why that's happening. Okay. Right. 10 and two creates this really pretty backyard loop where I can stop in this perfect uniform, um, position, but it's not the most practical for every cast and every fishing situation. There mm -hmm. might be a bass right there and I might just have to get my fly in there, right? right? I might have to drop my rod tip a little bit, open my loop, allow my dry fly to kind of flutter versus this kind of up and then drop. Mm -hmm. Or I might want to change the angle of, of my attack with my power to cut some wind. Right? If it's super windy, I might be angled down a little bit and I might really try and drive that fly line yep. in towards towards the water. So 10 and 2 is is this fallacy of of stay here and you'll be great. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, what you need to know is where you stop your rod. So the angle that you stop your rod on the front and the back controls loop shape. The wider the angle, mm -hmm. the taller the loop, the tighter the angle, the tighter the loop. Right. And if you know that, you can say, okay, look, I have a really nice tight loop on my back cast, right? Nice tight loop, but then I'm, I have this kind of big open giant bass fishing frog loop on the front. And that's probably okay, right? Cause you're throwing a bigger fly. You might not want this pencil tight loop, but if you're in a saltwater situation where you got 20 miles an hour wind, you might say, okay, you know what? Now I'm gonna stop my rod tip a little taller and I might change my angle of attack, come a little taller on the top and hammer that fly in there. So those are kind of the rules for where to stop your rod as far as creating a, a better looking loop. Everybody can throw really nice, pretty loops in the backyard if they stick to 10 and two, yeah. but it's not the most practical for fishing, I think. So that was the TFO, and now we're rigging up the- We're onto the TNT. We're onto the TNT. Thomas. About to do some work, man, I'm pumped.
All right, y'all, so everything felt good with the TNT. Now we're on to the Sage X, gonna give this thing a whirl. Actually, one of the biggest tips I just got, I was constantly trying to get more distance every time I would hit that front swing and I would let go of more line. And then Christian's like, well, just, just don't let any more line out. But so I was just trying to really focus on my stopping point rather than letting line out every single time I was on a front swing and that helped me just kind of dial things in. And then I started to get more distance when I did choose to allow the line to go free. So that was a big pointer. Anyways, now we're onto the Sage. Let's see what happens. All right, y'all, so we're going to go ahead and get this thing spooled up. We did a whole lot of casting, and we ended up, myself, I ended up liking the TFO's uh, feel as far as would it be the action, right? It, it seemed like that, what was that, mid, the TNT? Yeah. To me, and, and my inexpertise, felt a little bit slower and a little bit more flimsy, and maybe just my casting specifically was not as good with it, so I uh, set that one to the side. Don't think we didn't cast around the Sage and the Scott, and I think we'll probably upgrade to one of those fairly soon, because the fact of the matter is we're gonna have this gear for a very long time, and now it's time to talk fly line, get this thing spooled up, and head out to go fishing. So what do we got here? So fly line is, is kind of the last piece of the puzzle, and, and one that's often overlooked. I, I personally think um, not only in in whether it's cold water salt water or, or warm water um, but in the taper of the fly line so you can see back here there's a taper chart and guys that really know the rod that they're fishing and, and know what they're doing really look into this taper chart so the first thing you'll see there's there's various colors and there's a color change um, I believe this, it, it defines the head as 38 foot. So it's a little bit of a shorter head. It's not a line that you're gonna want to be carrying 60 foot of fly line as you're casting like we were doing out there. The reason why is all your weight is concentrated up front. It's, mm -hmm. it's designed to have 35 foot of fly line out, pick up and shoot like we talked about. And then now you're at 55, 60 feet and you can fish and then you can pick up and make quick, short, not carrying all this fly line. Inversely, you'll see this head is almost 50 foot. Okay. Right, so that's maybe the same weight, right? Let's say it's the same grain weight, but the the, the weight is distributed further into the running line, which okay. is this portion. Um, and it's gonna allow you to carry a little bit more fly line um, while retaining the same kind of punch or power. Um, and then this, I believe, so I know it says it's rated for a different fish, but just, you know, for well, me. This is marketing, right? This is, okay. The only, <laughs> thing you need to, the only thing you need to know is Rio Grande has been around forever. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you can only go catch brown trout on it. But yes. what it does mean is that it's a cold water fly line. Okay. Right? So we talked about a little bit, but a cold water fly line in a warm water situation, mm -hmm. it's going to get real sticky and gummy. You might have felt it out there. It just doesn't yeah. want to shoot it. It just, it acts almost as this kind of wet, limp noodle. And would you say the cold water line is like 50 degrees and below, or is it even cooler necessary? Uh, no, in most... I would say it's somewhere around there. The change happens some somewhere in the mid 60s, where okay, they, they really the, start okay. to not want to play ball. Um, but moral of the story is it's gonna work in, in most conditions, other than, you know, a, a cesspool in the middle of Texas summer and the water <laughs> temps are 98 degrees. I mean, that's when this line's really gonna perform poorly. Okay. But it will be great for, like we talked about, wintertime striper fishing, what have you. Um, and then also all of these are all floating lines, which is what I'd recommend that you start with. Okay. Um, inversely, this line being a warm water fly line is mm -hmm. gonna suffer a little bit in the cold water. What'll happen is it'll feel kind of stiff and, and, and it might have more memory and be a little bit more coily. Okay. Um, so doesn't mean that you can't cheat and use both a little bit here and there, but if you're the guy that's like, Dude, I, I go to the White River five times a year and it's freezing cold in Northern Arkansas. I'd say, man, this is the line for you. Okay. If you're like, I'm gonna bass fish 90% of the time and I might go trout fishing once, you're gonna be able to get away with this. So I'd probably try and get away with this is what totally. you're saying. The yeah, I think I'm gonna be doing line. bass fishing just because it's what's around here in our local waters uh, the majority of the time. The the smallmouth line is, is a great line. It's got um, a 40 foot head almost, and then it's got an orange kind of high vis fly line. So it makes it easy for you to see as the mm -hmm. angler. Um, and then the bonefish line, for example, it's gonna have similar properties, uh, but that head's gonna be stretched out a little bit further. Okay. I would say as you progress, this might be something that you, you play around with and think about, well, I might want to carry a lot of fly line at some point, but this is gonna get the job done, and that's the one I, I think you should go with, personally. Well, we'll go with that one then. Thank I wanna you. take your recommendations and run with it. I don't wanna be the guy that thinks he knows it all, because <laughs> let me tell you what, <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> anything but. <laughs> so there we go, y'all.
Here's the First final product. impressions. What on earth? She's looking too clean. Yeah, man. That's hey, that's legit. Look at the orange with the blue. Woo! -hoo. We'll add some pink later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We might have something special in store for y'all at some point. Yeah, we're gonna really make this thing. I call it eye candy. <laughs> we're gonna deck it out with some bright colors. Woo! All right. That's it, man. There he is. There he is. You got a good one. You got a good one. You got a good one. Oh, it's so exciting. My first fish on the fly rod. And a good one. Too. And a good one. Too. My first one was like tiny. <laughs>